All right. Glory. All right. Don't forget, everybody, Saturday morning we're going to be here. Um, I'm going to be here about 8, between, between 8 and 9, but probably closer to 8. Um, we're going to be getting the uh, barbecue on, getting it going. We chop it in the afternoon. Uh, potato peelers. The um, We actually started calling it the penny potato peeler because it's an alliteration. You know, P, 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 penny potato peelers. You know, so we have an alliteration. Hallelujah. Just only because we just thought it was kind of cool to have an alliteration. Um, oh, we could do it instead of making it penny. We could call it the potato peeler posse. And that's an alliteration. All right. Hallelujah. Um, so they'll be peeling about 70 pounds of potatoes. Um, Larry's bringing the cabbage over Friday night, bringing his, his cooker over Friday night. So we don't need to get my cook. We do need to get, we get the fryer. Get the deep fryer here. All right. Okay. Yep. All right. Because I, I plan on coming here and not having to go there back to my house on Saturday. All right. And then it's going to be fried chicken barbecue. Hallelujah. Cornbread sticks and potatoes and coleslaw. Hallelujah. And then I understand that we've got a peach cobbler coming from Rita and with apple spice something, you said? An apple cobbler. Ooh. With cinnamon? Is that what I got with cinnamon in it? Um, anybody else going to bring a dessert? Uh, uh, Belinda's bringing e chocolate eclair cake and almond joy cake. Oh, yeah, that's what I said. Uh, I said, yield to that, sister. Yeah, oh, I've had almond joy cake, and it is good. You know, because it's got coconut, almonds, and chocolate. And it's hallelujah. So um, bring desserts. Hallelujah. Um, we'll probably send out text for some things we need. Uh, Rita, you're already doing something, so you, you know, you're not, do you get the text from the church? Okay. I, I couldn't remember if you got them or, write, or if you were text savvy and you read them or not. I just didn't remember. Uh, some people don't, they go, I don't read text. Okay. Because um, we're going to need hamburger buns for sandwiches, people who want sandwiches. We're going to need things like tea and drinks and that kind of thing. Okay. Uh, we're taking care of everything else. The church is. We're just going to cover everything else. All right. We are. Um, hey, guys. How's everybody doing out there? We're just taking a little care of a little church business. If you're in the area on Sunday, uh, we're having our annual Down East Barbecue and Fried Chicken. Um you know, it's a Eastern, Eastern style barbecue with uh, deep fried chicken, and uh, that will be um, our after our morning service. We invite you to come be with us. We'd love to have you in the service, and then go eat with us. Um, so it, it's good barbecue. I'm telling you right now. I won't say it slap your mama good, but it slap your mama good. <laughs> Hallelujah! And uh, then we'll have desserts, and we're going to have a little. We're going to have a kind of a fall festival for our kids here. Uh, and you got kids, bring them on out. We'd love to have them come and join us for some candy and games and uh, s'mores at the fire pit. And uh, you can play on the playground. So we'd love to have you. 6302 Walter Wright Road here in Pleasant Garden, North Carolina. Uh, we are 4.3 miles from the Elm Eugene exit off of Interstate 85. That's exit 124. We're 4.3 miles from there. We are three miles north of NC-62 off of Hunt Road, which is the same thing as Pleasant Garden Road. Um, that road becomes Pleasant Garden Road just another half mile down the road here. Um, so if you're down that side of the county, you can take 62 over to Hunt Road, come right up, and we're right there three miles away. We'd love to have you with us. Praise the Lord. rest of you, go ahead and let's get our Bibles out. Um, let's go to Matthew... Let's go to Mark. There, now here again, um, there are the synoptic Gospels, and those are the three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that um, parallel closely. Not, not everything, but they parallel closely. And because they recount so much of the similar material, they're referred to as the synoptic Gospels. John's Gospel stands alone, and it shares events and stories and uh, teachings that Jesus did that are not shared in the other three. And um, so, you know, we get a broader, we get, you know, larger picture of things from reading all of them. 
Um, Mark was written to Gentiles. Matthew was written to Jews. Um, and so when you, you look at that, why they wrote the way they wrote, uh, Luke's gospel leaves the crown thorns out. Okay, how many of you ever seen the movie Jesus that was done on the Jesus Project about 30 years ago? They, they are almost 40 now. Came out with that G, the, the movie Jesus and the, the uh, Jesus Project. It's been translated into 100 plus languages around the world and shown all over the world. And I mean, almost in one place, I almost had riots because the people were so angry they crucified Jesus. I mean, they, you know, they, they were so upset that they crucified Jesus. And, uh, they, they, you know, so anyway, um, but um, that movie left out the crown. And the reason they said, they said, we know it's there in the other Gospels, but we strictly went completely 100% by the Gospel of Luke without varying from it. So, um, so they told the story from Luke's perspective. All right. Here we have um, the daughter of Jairus, and it is shared in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, I, I believe I like Mark's account better, although they cover the same material. Um, let's look in Mark chapter 5. Um, let's get down to verse 21. Now, this is right after Jesus to cast the devil out of the guy, and um, he leaves that area. Hallelujah. In, in other Gospels, it's the, it's the man with the the, um, the legion, okay? And in verse 21, then Jesus was passed again by ship unto the other side. Much people gathered unto him, and he was nigh unto the sea. And behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet. And he besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed, and she shall live. And uh, Jesus went with him. And much people followed him and thronged him. Now, just to establish a pictorial of this event, how many of you have ever been in, in like, a, like a Walt Disney World or a big theme park? that was really, really busy. And it's like a sea of people. You can't walk because you're bumping into everybody. You ever been on this day and you're thinking, why did I come today? Okay? Um, you're like, oh, my goodness. You can't, you can't even take a step forward without stepping on somebody's foot or getting knocked around. You're, guess what you're in? A throng. People bumping into you, running into you. Uh, you're getting knocked around. When Janie, and I, when Janie was 16, we, uh, my family went to Disney World for a vacation over Christmas, and she got to go with us. And uh, we got in. We went in the front gates to the Magic Kingdom, and when we got in there, the whole. And of course, back then you didn't have all the five parks. You had the Magic Kingdom and Epcot. And that was about it back then. Um, it's been a lot. That's a long time ago. And as we're going down the main street there, everybody in the world was going in the park at the same time through that same path. And I was holding on to her hand. We got separated. And the crowd took me over here. And it took her over there. I, I finally got up under one of the, the storefronts where they had the, the shelters over. And I'm jumping up and down trying to find her. Now, being five foot two for her didn't help any. She could have had one of them flags up there. I may not have seen it. I finally saw her. I had to work my way back into that crowd and let it take me over that way. But that was being thronged. So much people followed here, Jairus and Jesus, and he is thronged. Meaning what? You wouldn't know. You, you know people are touching you. You have no idea who. If they're bumping into you the hand, the leg, the feet. If it's a kid that ran into you with their, with their noggin. You just don't know. Okay? So this is the picture. Much people followed him and thronged him. And there's a reason the Bible puts that in there. <clears throat> uh, amen? <coughs> and um, and, a, and a certain woman, now remember, Jesus is on his way to raise up Jairus' daughter. Okay? And a certain woman, now let me say this, a certain woman means this is not a parable. It's not a story. It's a, it's a certain woman.
which had an issue of blood 12 years. I'm sorry, I lost exactly where I was. And had suffered many things of many physicians and spent all that she had and was nothing better but rather grew worse. Now, she had, a, she had an issue of blood. She had a flow of blood considered unclean. She was not to be in public. When she heard of Jesus, came in the press. What's that press? That's another way of saying throng. Now, remember, she's unclean. And according to law, being unclean, she was to, when she got near people, she was to stop and say, unclean, unclean, so that they would not come in contact with her. They considered it a communicable disease. Therefore, she wasn't allowed to come in contact with people and was required by Jewish law to announce she was unclean. Okay? Maybe that's what we should do with the COVID people. Unclean, unclean. Well, of course, we know who you are because you've got your mask on still. <laughs> Did I just say that? <laughs> I was, I was a chick, <laughs> I was a chick for lady yesterday, and I was in line, and there was, there was somebody behind me, and you know, they weren't really, really close, but they were behind me, and I'm giving my order, and I felt this sneeze come on. And it was one of them quick ones where you don't have time to do anything. And I turned real quick. I was doing, going like this. I went, I went Hachow! and that man jumped three feet backwards. I said, I'm sorry. I said, I, I, said, I was trying not to seize on her. And, and I was getting my arm up there. I mean, he, I, you would have thought I was bubonic plague. I mean, come on, dude. It was a sneeze. I mean, do I look like death warmed over three times? <laughs> oh, I want a Chick-fil-A biscuit. <laughs> oh, I feel terrible. No. Anyway. But she had suffered with this thing for over 12 years. Spent everything she had on all the physicians and all the things they said they could do to help fix her, and they couldn't. She got worse. She didn't get better. She got worse. When she heard of Jesus, I am telling you, this is why it is so important that we get busy about ministering to people and seeing the supernatural because it spreads. People hear about it. The message gets out. The word gets out. Amen? When she heard of Jesus, well, she's at home with an issue of blood, basically housebound, 12 years, Anytime she gets out, she goes to the doctor and spends the rest of the money. She don't have nothing left. She came in the press behind and touched his garment. She came into the throng and touched his garment. For she said. Now, we do have other accounts in the New Testament where uh, people touched the hem of his garment and were made whole. So this, may, this must have been something common that happened was people just would get close enough to him to touch his garments and they'd get healed. Because why? Healing virtue went out of him. Healing power went out of him. Healing power still goes out of him. Glory to God. For she said, if I may but touch his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue or power, okay, had gone out of him, turned about in the press. Now, again, they're using press, but I'm going to tell you that the press is a throng. Okay? And said, who touched my clothes? And I think other gospels say, who touched me? Here he makes it very clear. Who touched my clothes? And the disciples said unto him, now, here you go. This is, the, this is the spiritual bunch he had following him around. you got to think. they got to start Thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and sayest thou who touched me? Let me put that in modern English. Okay? Because King Jimmy kind of tem uh, tempers the sarcasm here. It really does. Thou seest the multitude throng of thee, and sayest thou who touched me? Let me put it like this. 
Jesus, you, everybody around here is bumping up against you. Everybody's touching you. That's really what they were saying. Like, what's wrong with you? Did I get enough sleep last night? Did you drink decaf instead of caffeinated this morning? I mean, they're, they're just being carnal. And I love Jesus. I mean, when the stupid comes out, look at him. And he looked around about to see her that had done this thing. He didn't even respond. I, 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 I kind of get the feeling that maybe he went, <sighs> thinking what he says later. Have I been with thou so long? Have, if, you, if you've seen to me, you've seen the Father. you got to think he thinks some of that stuff. Will they ever get it, Father? He doesn't even respond to their stupidity. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. Now, let's back back up. When she heard of Jesus, what did she hear? She had to hear that people were touching his clothes and getting healed. And the Bible says she came in the press and touched his garment for she said. Now, here's an interest, interesting thing. The Greek tense here, for she said, really says it this way. If you carry it out in the full Greek tense of this, this passage, for she said and kept on saying, if I may touch him, I'll be whole. If I can touch his garment, I shall be whole. If I can touch his garment, I shall be whole. If I can touch his garment, I shall be whole. She didn't just say it one time. She kept saying it. And instead of going out in the public going, I'm unclean, I'm unclean, I'm unclean, she is going, if I can touch him, I'll be whole. If I can touch him, I'll be whole. If I can touch him, I'll be whole. If I can touch him. Then she gets there, and what's there when she gets to where Jesus is? A throng. Now, somehow, she's got to get in there and touch him. Isn't that right? I said, isn't that right? Glory to God. Now, I believe that she actually got down and crawled in. Because when there's a bunch of people like that, you can crawl between them quicker than you can walk through them. Now, that's my, my, my vision of this. is she got in and crawled in there and got the hem of his garment and touched it, and, the, and immediately he knew virtue. Healing power flowed out of him. Now, unless you've experienced this, it's hard to explain it. But when I've ministered to people, and you feel the healing power go out of you. Literally can feel it flow out of you into the person. And um, I've heard Dad Hagen talk about this, but I've also experienced it. Go into them and come right back out of them. You had to stop and instruct them. Get a bit faith. But literally can feel the power of God flow into them out of you. So he's going through this crowd, getting touched, bang, pushed around, throng, curiosity touchers. The Elvis groupies are there. You know, they don't, they don't, they just all show up. They're all that crazy, groupie kind of people. Jesus is famous. They all want to be say, I saw Jesus. And they're not touching him with the touch of faith. They're touching him with curiosity. But then one touch came out of all of that. And virtue went out. What was the difference? Notice that the virtue just wasn't flowing automatically. It flowed when a touch came in contact with him, that was a touch of faith. He touched her when she touched him. David Engel song. That's about the woman, the woman with the issue of blood. When she said, if I can touch him, I'll be whole. She got up out of that place where she'd been basically bedridden, went out into public, which was against the law, Went down the street and instead of crying out unclean, she was crying, if I can touch him, I'll be whole. If I can touch him, I'll be whole. If I can touch him, I'll be whole. And when she got there, she would not be denied. 
She went right through that press, right through that throng, got in there and touched his clothes. You can imagine, it's almost like, you know, the hand reaching through the crowd just enough to get to him. And with all those other people touching him and banging against him and curiosity and what all that, suddenly virtue goes out of him. What's the difference? Faith. Well, how do you know it's faith? Because he said it was. And I'll take him over your PhD any day of the week. Hello. I'll take him over your seminary training any day of the week. He, after she told him the whole story, he said, go your way. Your faith has made you whole. He didn't say, I made you whole. He didn't go, <laughs> well, lady, I am the son of God. And uh, just so you know that, I sent power out to you to heal you. Aren't I special? That's not what he did. He's just going about his business, and somebody out of that crowd got to him in faith, and when they did, the virtue that was resonant and available to every single person in that crowd got released into one person who came, and according to Jesus, came in faith. Hallelujah. I said, hallelujah. Are you here? You're going home. Okay? And so, Jesus said, your faith made you whole. But what did she do? She heard. That's why we got to go, people. That's why we got to minister. That's why we got we to lay hands on people. We got to do things. Because when people get ministered to and people get healed, they start sharing it with people. And the word gets out. Well, I went over to that church over there and got healed. So the pastor laid hands on me. The guest you know, speaker laid hands on me. One of the people in the church laid hands on me. See, it's not just me. I remember um, Buddy Harrison. That was Kenneth Hagin's son-in-law. Married Sister Pat. Brother Buddy went home to be with the Lord uh, about four years before Dad did. And um, very close to Buddy. Um, loved Brother Buddy Harrison. He was, he was very important in my life. And uh, very, um, very influential. And, um, you know, he preached at our church. He dedicated us, into, he set us into the pastorate here at the church. And um, very special to us. And um, my brother Buddy, um, oh, he, um, he had um, started Faith Christian Fellowship up in North Tulsa. They bought an old um Kmart or something and turned it into a church, sat 5,000 people. I was there in their, their initial, very first service in the building. It was, camp, it was the Sunday night before camp meeting, 1980. And um, Noble Hayes preached. 118 degrees outside that day, and the air condition broke. <laughs> Say hot. Hot. And... Um, but we, you know, I'd go to church over there, you know, and, and not all the time because it was on the it was on the far north side of town, and um, but you know, brother Buddy, um, I remember him sharing about um, they had greeters. See, you can be a Holy Ghost greeter. Well, you've got to have a pulpit, pulpit ministry. No, you don't. You can have greeter ministry. And Brother Buddy was on the radio out there in Tulsa and was <clears throat> teaching on healing and teaching on acting on your faith. And there's a woman listening to him there in Tulsa on the radio. And um, she was sick, very sick, had been sick for a long time, almost housebound. Um, she could still drive, but she just was just not doing well. And um, he started teaching on, you know, acting on your faith and stuff. And she said, I'll tell you what I'm doing. I'm getting up this Sunday morning. I'm getting in my car, and I'm driving over to that church, and I'm going to have him lay hands on me, and I'm going to receive my healing. Sunday got there, she got in her car, and she drove over there to north, uh, on the north side of Tulsa to Faith Christian Fellowship, and she got out of her car and started walk, walk, working her way in to walk into the building, and a greeter standing at the door, and, and, and the Holy Ghost spoke to her. He said, 
grab the next person that walks through the door and dance with them. It's this woman. And she opened the door, walked in, and that greeter just went and grabbed her hand and said, Woo! And started dancing in circles with her. She got instantly healed. She testified later. She, she was healed, didn't even get to get in the healing line, didn't have Brother Buddy lay hands on her. She just got to go in and enjoy the service. Because the Holy Ghost greet, greet her, listened to the Spirit of God, and danced with her, and did what he said to do, and she got healed. Praise God. I said, isn't that great? Amen. So we, we need everybody working and walking with God and do what God has for you to do. Miracles take place there. I said, miracles take place there. Can you say amen? All right. And so, daughter of thy faith hath made thee whole, go in peace, and behold thy plague. And while he yet spake, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house certain which said, they talking about the, the, the rain on the party crowd. Thy daughter is dead. Why troublest thou the master any further? And here we just had this miracle, this woman getting healed. The doomsday group shows up. Look, forget it. Your daughter's dead. Leave them alone. You didn't get there in time. And as soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he saith to the ruler of the synagogue, be not afraid, only believe. What did he do? He stopped him before he could open his mouth. He stopped him from speaking unbelief and going into grief and getting into doubt. He said, be not afraid, only believe. And he suffered or allowed no man to follow him, save or except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And he cometh to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and seeth the tumult and them that wept and wailed greatly. Now, you understand in that culture, in, e in Middle Eastern culture, they have professional mourners. Okay? So somebody dies. You, you might be on the, you, you're, and, and like churches have the praise team and that, they had the mourn team. Now, I'm not joking. They literally had the mourn team. And they'd show up at the house and sit out there, oh, oh, I mean, just go into all kind of tumult. And we know they're not sincere about what happens after, after he shows up. So he gets there, they're all there, oh, I mean, all doing all that. And they said about, how you know it was loud? Because they said they wailed greatly. And when he was come in, he saith unto them, why you make this ado and weep? The damsel's not dead, but sleepeth. And they went, oh, <laughs> he's crazy. I mean, they laughed him to scorn. So I know they're not there in sincerity. They turned right around and started laughing at him to scorn. But when he had, and I don't think it was a gentle put out. See, when faith shows up, it don't play. It doesn't let unbelief hang around. Wigglesworth did that with the woman who's going, you know, he brought, he brought the missionary to pray for the husband who's about to die. And the missionary started praying, now, Lord, prepare the heart of our soon-to-be bereaved sister on the passing of her husband. And she's over there going, yeah, Lord, yeah, Lord, prepare my heart. And Wigglesworth said, stop him, stop him, Lord. He's filling the atmosphere with unbelief and threw them both out. Five minutes later, walked out with the man totally healed. See, you got, you got to shut, you got to, you got to cut unbelief off with the kneecaps. Amen. And, um. But when he had put them all out, he taketh the father and the mother of the damsel and them that were with him. Who was that? Peter, James, and John. And, uh, there, and they entered in where the damsel was lying. And he looked at the damp by the hand. He took the damsel by the hand and said unto her, Talitha kumi, which is by being interpreted, damsel, I say unto thee, arise. And straightway the damsel awoke and walked for she was of the age of 12 years, and they were astonished with great astonishment, and he charged astonishment, and he charged them straightly that no man should know it, and he commanded that something should be given to her to eat. Hallelujah. Now, think about this. Here he comes in, 
shows up, tells him she's not dead, she's asleep. The, um, the professional mourners start acting the fool. He throws them out, raises her up from the dead. Glory to God. Now, in between his initial call to go there and him getting there, he heals the woman with the, well, the, woman with the issue of blood gets healed because she came in the press. Amen? Hallelujah. And our next one was the woman with the issue of blood, but that's, that's a two, you can't read that story without covering both of them at the same time. Um, you just can't do it. Okay? You just can't do it. So Jesus tells one woman, thy faith made her whole, raising Jairus' daughter from the dead, what he had to do was stop unbelief from being spoken. He could still work. Can't work in an atmosphere of unbelief. Amen? Remember, he could there do no mighty work, save he laid his hand on a few sickly folk and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. Y'all here? Y'all gone home? Let me show it to you. Look at where am I here? Next chapter. And he went out from thence and came into his own country. Now, we, a lot of people deal with this. Um, I don't know that I do. I mean, because a lot of my friends that have watched, and, you know, they, they, they've watched our, our ministry on Facebook or whatever, and you know, they tell me they enjoyed it and that kind of stuff. But in places, you know, there'll be people who go, oh, that's just Eddie. We remember him when, and when there's some things they remember that, that we're not supposed to remember. <laughs> okay? Did some things back when we were young we weren't supposed to do. We did. I mean, let's just face it, we did. You know, I set off the M80 at the, at the playground when the cops right there on the corner. My brother lied, said he, the boy went that way, and I had gone the other way. Okay? Um, you know, we, we did stupid stuff. We were stupid. That's why they call it young and dumb. Okay? Um, but he went out there and so came into his own country, and his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many, were, uh, many hearing him were astonished, saying, From whence hath this man these things? And what, this, what wisdom is this which is given unto him, that even such mighty works are wrought by his hands? Now, here, we, here you go. Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and of Judah and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. Why? Because they remembered him in the flesh. Now, he would have probably been called in, in, in British terminology, you know, Jesus Joseph's son. Okay? And Jesus said unto them, A prophet's not without honor, but in his own country, and among his own kin, and in his own house. Now, let me say this. I did deal with that um, for a, period, a good period of time with my own family. They didn't have the respect or whatever for me in ministry because I was Eddie. I remember when I was going to Bible school, I was told that my sister, that nobody knew their Bible like my sister. That she knew more than I knew. Okay? Now that's changed over years, but it took years, decades. Okay? For you know, the family to see you in a different light. Okay, because they knew Eddie, and then we, and then my, when my parents had gotten married, and you know, <clears throat> merch, you know, merch, I was a merch family. <coughs> we had cousins, you know, for me it was step cousins, but uh, one of them was named Eddie. So I was Big Eddie, and he was Little Eddie, because Eddie, because he was younger and I was older. So we always got called Big and Little. We didn't get our names called Big and Little. When everybody was there, Big and Little, come on. Didn't you get, get didn't you didn't get the Eddie part. Hallelujah. And they thought I was crazy because I had gone to that Rima Bible Training Center. <laughs> Rima. They thought we were a cult. 
I'm glad I run with that crowd. But listen to this. A prophet is not without honor in his own country, among his own kin, and in his own house. And, they, and he could there do no mighty work. Stop. Underline could. Because it doesn't say would not. He said he could not. There's a big difference between would not and could not. Would not would have meant he had the ability at that moment in time, but wouldn't do it because they were offended at him or he was not happy with them or whatever, but he didn't say that. He said he could not. He could there do no mighty work. Savior laid his hands on a few sick. Now, the word in the Greek sick here literally leans more towards sickly, minor ailments, headache, and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. He marveled because of their unbelief. And he went round about the villages teaching. The only way to fix the unbelief was to teach the word. He had to, he had the only way to fix the unbelief was to teach the word. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Amen. So of the two times that I could tell you definitively that Jesus marveled, he marveled at the unbelief of people of covenant, and he marveled at the faith of a centurion who's outside the covenant, who didn't have a right to it. Okay? <clears throat> Look over Matthew 9. Down into verse 27. And when Jesus departed thence, the two men followed him and crying and saying, Thou son of David, have mercy on us. And he was coming to the house, the blind man came to him, and Jesus said unto them, Believe ye that I am able to do this? They said unto him, Yea, Lord. And he, he touched he their eyes, saying, According to your faith be it unto you. And their eyes were opened, and Jesus straightly charged them, saying, See that no man know it. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Glory to God. And um, But when they were departed, spread abroad the fame in all that country. And as they went out, behold, their brought to him a dumb man possessed with a devil. Anybody that's got a devil's dumb. It's a joke. Y'all, y'all, this went right over y'all's head. <laughs> Hallelujah. He was dumb, a dumb man. He, he couldn't talk, okay? Uh, possessed with a devil. So what is this? He, it's the spirit of infirmity. There wasn't a physical reason he couldn't talk. The, he had a spirit of infirmity on him. Okay? And when the devil was cast out, the dumb spake. See, there wasn't any physical reason he couldn't. He was possessed with a devil that wouldn't let him talk. Hello? And the multitudes marveled, saying, it's never so seen in Israel. The Pharisees said, oh, here you go. What? You're messing with their power structure. Religious folks get mad. I'm going to tell you right now, take a dead church. What I mean by a dead church? They don't believe nothing. And let some church come along and starts laying hands on the sick, casting out devils, raising the dead, healing the sick, getting people saved, and, and doing the works of Jesus, and they will gnash on you with their teeth. Hello? And they'll start accusing you of working with the devil. That speaking in tongues is of the devil. Oh, I love Brother Hagin's response. He had, um, now Brother Hagin um, got born again on the bed of affliction, reading Grandma's Methodist Bible. Okay, he was Southern Baptist. He got born again. He was a Southern, he, he was in the Southern Baptist Church, 
And um, after he got saved, he went out and preached for and, and preached healing. As a Baptist, not not filled with the Spirit, but a Baptist, really, because he had been raised up off the deathbed. But he got to hang around the Pentecostals. And one of the um, um, leading leader me, leading men in the church got wind that Brother Hagin was slipping over there and praying with them Pentecostals. Well, what had happened? He had gotten filled with the Holy Ghost, speaking in tongues. And he shared that that man. He said, you be careful. That stuff's of, he said, that speaking in tongues is of the devil. He said, well, I'm going to tell you one thing. If that's of the devil, then the whole Southern Baptist denomination is of the devil. The man said, what are you talking about? He said, the same spirit that bore witness to me that Jesus is Lord, that I'm the child of God, is the same spirit that filled me, caused me to speak in tongues. <laughs> man didn't know what to do. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Okay. You'll make people mad. You'll make religious people mad. And instead of them being excited that people are getting healed and getting blessed and getting, uh, getting uh, things come from God, they're changing their life, they'll get mad. They'll take that old hymnal in the song book and change it from, oh, say that I'm glad, I'm glad, to say, oh, say that I'm mad, I'm mad. Um, let's look at Matthew. Let me, let me see here. Matthew chapter 15. And we'll look down into uh, verse 21. Then Jesus went thence and departed into the coast of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have son on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with a devil. And he answered her, not a word. Now, we, we know from the two different Gospels that she's Syrophoenician, okay? Um, and it, which, was a, which was a mixed race considered not under the covenants, okay? But the, uh, he answered her not a word. The disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. She's aggravating them. He said, it, he said and um, answered and said, I'm not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It's not meat to take the children's bread and cast it to dogs. My Lord, if you did this in church today, you'd be on the 6 o'clock news tonight. They'd be writing letters to the superintendent of the conference. They'd be demanding your resignation from ministry. They'd publish articles and books about how hateful you are and how sorry you are and how mean you were to my mama. They would. And most people would turn around and walk off with, he called me a dog. I can't believe, and he calls himself a preacher. He thinks he's a Christian and called me a dog. You know I'm telling it. It's exactly what would happen today. But this is not what she said. That's not what she said. She didn't give a rip what he called her. She said, truth, Lord, truth, Lord. Yet the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. I'll be a dog. If I can get what I came for, I'll be a dog. He says and said, O woman, great is thy faith, be it unto thee even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. Now, why did he do that? She was considered a dog because she was an outcast, half I'm just going to use the term half-breed, half-caste, half-breed. She wasn't pure Jew. See, we've got that, that, that stuff going on historically all the time. It's not just an American thing. Racism and, you know, uh, prejudice is not just a white American thing. It's, it's everywhere. All races, all times in history, all peoples. Come on now. 
Now, I'm going to be honest with you. There are some racist black folk, and I met some last week. Ran right into them. There's racist white people. There's racist Mexicans. There's racist um, um, Asians. There's racist Islanders. There's racist everything. People think they're superior because, they, because of their culture, their whatever. It's true. But I'm not going to sit around and live in your little woke world of what you have to do to prove you're not a racist. I'm just going to go out and do what Jesus did. I ain't going to worry about your, your declaration of what I must do to prove that I'm not a racist. Because you're the biggest racist of all trying to prove that to me. Because when you tell me I'm a racist automatically because I'm white, you're a racist. If you say I am a racist solely because I'm white, then you are a racist. That went over big. Say amen, oh me, help me Jesus, or, or give me the church finger as you walk out the door because it's true. Hello. And I'm not going to play your game. I'm going to share Jesus. We're going to minister to people. We're going to minister to them no matter what their ethnicity is. We're not, we're not going to worry about that. We're just going to share Jesus. Amen. And, um, oh, and then, you know, she, he said, oh, woman, great is thy faith. Be thou to thee, even as thy daughter. As I will, thy daughter was made whole from the very hour. Now, what happened here? Because she is an outcast from the covenants, she doesn't have a right to the children's bread. Because she doesn't have a right to it, she can't have faith to get it. Under the covenant. See, they had, a Jew had a right to come and receive healing, although mo most of the time they didn't because they just, they didn't have any faith for some stupid reason. That's why he marveled because of their unbelief. But she got into faith and said, that's all right. I don't have to have the full-blown covenant blessings. Just give me a crumb of that what falls off, and I'll, that's enough to get it from me. He just goes, well, well, you got that kind of faith? You got it. And she got it. Hallelujah. Amen. I said amen. Praise the Lord. Yeah, because Luke's gospel says, uh, Mark's gospel says this way in verse 26. The woman was a Greek, a Syrophoenician by nation. She had absolutely no right to healing. But she reached over by faith and got a hold of the crumbs. I'll take the crumbs, Jesus. That's all it's going to take to get what I need. Call me a dog if you want to. If you'll give me a crumb. And she got what she needed. He did that because he had to locate where she was to get her to act out of faith and not trying to come based on a covenant that she didn't have a right to. Amen. Uh, let's look here at, um, let me see what we got left here. We got about six more. And we're not going to do any more. Uh, we're not even going to get started. Okay? We'll, we'll pick up here next week. Y'all get any, 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 anything out of all of this? Hallelujah. Yeah? Maybe? Huh? All right. Just wondering. Glory to God. Um, let's receive our offering for Wednesday night. Do an offering envelope of the few that are left in the building. Um, grab one. If you use it electronically, go ahead and get that ready to send it. Hallelujah. Don't forget, Saturday morning about 9 o'clock, we're going to start showing up. And again, if you can't, well, I can't be there right now. Don't worry about it. We're going to be here. We're going to be here most of the day. Okay? Somebody's going to be on site most of the day. Um, we're going to do some different things. We're going to take some of the stuff out of this room over here and get it out of there. Uh, those extra chairs we don't need in there and get it, get the paints and the stuff out and get it into the storage room until we get a storage feeling bit back here. Ain't just need just leaving it there. We don't need it. We've done our work. Okay? Get that to the storage unit. Get it out of here. Um, that kind of thing while we're cooking, as long as I got somebody to leave on site with the food. Um, we're going to do that. We're going to try to do some stuff up here around the uh, the bumpers for the car tires on the front. 
I got these these landscape things to go down in between so we can get the rocks so they don't come up in the grass, so we can put more dirt down and replant grass for next year up there in the front, um, that kind of thing. Get the fire pit ready, you know, for for Saturday for Sunday. Um, might even if it's if it were chilly enough on Sunday Saturday I'd run up some fire on Saturday, but I don't know. Kind of get our, our our dishes ready, our our chafers, that kind of stuff. Prep work. Everybody say prep work. All right. All right. Father, we bless the people that give in Jesus' name. Amen. Give an electronic. Go ahead and send it to you. Been hell. Raise your hand. Brother, Brother Joe's got his uh, handy dandy. Yeah. When we bought the church, they left the, the offering trays because we'd always use buckets. So we got we got nice little trays now. All right. <clears throat> Thank you all for joining us tonight. Again, if you want to be, come be, be with us on Sunday, we'd love to have you. Um, like I said, down east, barbecue and fried chicken. Hallelujah. We call it Big Dog's Barbecue. Hallelujah. Uh, Pastor Ed's Break Big Dog Barbecue. Amen. Uh, until we meet again, remember these words from 1 John chapter 5, verse 4, that whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Love you. God bless you. See you on Sunday. Until then, be blessed.